uh, and uh, energy, which is relevant to all of us. Uh, and uh, we have experts and scientists who've been in this field for years to talk to you about it. So thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning. It is our absolute pleasure to have you this morning. Uh, we, today's topic, like I mentioned earlier, is uh, the water perspective. We'll learn about the impact and value of water research to this global health crisis. Uh, please note all attendees uh, automatically will have your uh, uh, Microphones muted, it's only so that uh, we can run this effic efficiently. Only I as a host can unmute them. Uh, but we do want this to be an interactive session, so please go to the Q&A uh, tab. Please ask as many questions as you want throughout the webinar, and we will aim to answer as many as possible. The webinar is indeed being recorded, and it will be shared on uh, HPQ's uh, video portal. Uh, if you're posting about the event on social media, and I, I hope you do, uh, the hashtag is uh, uh, hashtag Kiri webinar, that's Q-E-E-R-I webinar. The session is uh, ideally expected to be exactly one hour, but from experience we know that uh, you know uh, sometimes questions come in and we want to cater to as many questions as possible to make sure that you feel the value of this uh, webinar. And it may tend to go early, but we will try to stick to time as much as possible. If you want to manage the way you view your screen and you want to change the way you look at it, uh, you can just click that button on your top right corner. It, it, it looks just like that, the three squares, and you will be able to manage your view. Uh, uh, let's talk about the schedule just a little bit before I uh, introduce uh, today's speaker. We had three planned. One we've already completed on Sunday. Dr. Mohammed Ayub, our Senior Research Director for Environment and Sustainability, spoke about air quality. The video should be up on uh, uh, KD's uh, uh, and HPKU's uh, portal soon enough. And it was very interesting, and I hope you check it out as well. Today we have Dr. Jenny Lawler talking about uh, water research uh, globally, and it is a very exciting and interesting topic. And finally, on Thursday, I hope you will join us for this as well. We have our Senior Research Director for Energy speaking about energy-related research uh, you know, connected to COVID-19 and beyond. All right, it gives me great pleasure to in, uh, welcome and uh, introduce to you today's speaker. She's our Senior Research Director for the Water Center at Kiri, Dr. Jenny Lawler. Uh, Dr. Jenny has been in this field for over 15 years. She, in fact, is uh, fairly new to Qatar. It's, it's just been, I think, uh, six odd months, but you know, she, she's taken it to like fish to water. She, she's settled down really well. She's absolutely passionate about the provision of safe water to all as a human right and is involved in research at all levels, including, uh, you know, be, including being in the lab and the development of uh, products and technologies that can contribute to safeguarding water resources. She will be supported today by her team. We have uh, Dr. Dima Almasi and Dr. Sean Oginbi, both scientists at uh, Kiri's Water Center. So today promises to be uh, very interesting and very exciting. Uh, Dr. Jenny, as always, it's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Over to you. Good morning, Dharaz. Good morning, everybody. Salam alaikum and Ramadan Mubarak. Um, I'm delighted to be able to join you today and uh, talk a little bit about SARS-CoV-2, the virus that is caused uh, that causes COVID-19, um, and to be able to just give you a little idea of the global research that is happening in this area. So uh, to start off with, uh, Dilraz did ask me to say a little bit about uh, Kiri itself and how we are responding as a research institute to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, so some of you will be familiar with Kiri. Very briefly, we are a national research institute that is focused on environmental and energy related research. Um, we have a number of centers, the Water Center, which I lead. We also have the Energy Center, Environment and Sustainability Center, Computational Materials and Processes, Corrosion Center, Natural Environmental Hazards Observatory, and also our Earth Sciences Program. And we have over 4,000 meters squared of state-of-the-art laboratory space um, in Education City in Doha, Qatar. Um, we are part of Hamad bin Khalifa University under Qatar Foundation, um, and we, uh, we have have been operating since 2011 and as Dilra said I just joined in 2019 so um, I've been so delighted to join such a fantastic team of scientists and researchers here at Kiri. 
Um, in terms of um, our response to COVID, so like many institutions around the world, um, our labs have unfortunately been closed apart from the most essential services where we are helping out in government and other stakeholders um, since March. However, there is a lot of research that can really take place, um, which is remote, which is away from the lab, and which can be based on some of the really state-of-the-art monitoring tools that we have available to us. So as Mohammed will have explained in the webinar on Sunday, we have a lot of environmental monitoring, including for air quality, for weather patterns, for example, and we can really look at gathering that data and how it can um, impact on COVID-19 um, response in Qatar and beyond. And we have tried to really make a, a, a synthesis of the global and the local research in this area, and we've been very active in disseminating that to the public over the last couple of months, because we know that people obviously are worried and we want to keep them abreast of what is happening um, on the global stage in this area. Um, so my own centre, Kiri Water Centre, um, we have um, we have a, a, a quite a broad mandate to look at all types of water related research, particularly in the state of Qatar, which in which our groundwater resources are um, very limited and must be protected. And we also look at the various technologies and processes for water and um, water treatment. So that will include desalination processes for production of potable water, for drinking water for use um, around the state, and also for the treatment of wastewaters from various different industries, including municipal wastewater, industrial wastewater, oil and gas industry, and beyond. And we in particular look in the context of water sustainability, the impact of climate change, the impact of changing population and demographics, how we can really protect these type of water resources as strategic and look at water reuse and how water can be reused um, sensibly and sustainably as long as it's safe and it has the appropriate treatment technologies in place. And we can support that in terms of our abilities to monitor water quality um, across the board. So the aims of the session today, um, so first of all, um, I'd like to give a, a brief introduction to SARS-CoV-2 itself and how that has, um, how that, uh, the implications that the structure of the virus itself has on the water treatment and wastewater treatment. And then I'd like to talk about um, a topic called wastewater-based epidemiology, which is the study of wastewater to examine the health of a population. But the main focus that I think of today and where we can probably get the most value is I'd like to answer any questions that you might have related to water and um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so please, please go to the Q&A box and type in the questions that you have, any questions that you might have, and we'll try to answer as much questions as possible um, at the end. So the first thing that I'd like to talk about is a brief introduction to SARS-CoV-2. Now, bearing in mind that I'm not a virologist, um, but I do have a good, uh, a good kind of functioning knowledge of these kind of things, having worked in a school of biotechnology for over 10 years. So one of the first things that's interesting about SARS-CoV-2 is that it's an RNA virus. So if you have a look here, um, you can see the genetic material of that virus is RNA, ribonucleic acid, um, and it's single stranded. So whereas human DNA, for example, has, has two strands, it's a double stranded helix, RNA is like that, but it's one single strand. And there are a lot of RNA viruses that are we that we know about currently, including HIV, respiratory syncytial virus. There, there is a lot of them out there. So what this genetic material does, this RNA, is it encodes the instructions for this virus to replicate and to infect. So it gives the instructions to make to, for how the virus is structured itself. So the RNA, the genetic genetic material is surrounded by a nucleocapsid layer, so a protein layer that surrounds and protects the RNA. It's further surrounded by an envelope, which is made up of, of lipids and proteins. Um, and then it has this, uh, these spikes, which you will have heard a lot about in the media. So these protein spikes 
are the mechanism by which this virus um, is able to attach itself so efficiently to its host, which is uh, humans in this case, using a, a receptor that is present in the human body in many tissues called angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor ACE2. And this has a particular domain which is very um, able for this, this spike on the CoV2 structure to bind to. So the reason that I'm talking about the RNA structure and the structure of this virus in a little bit of detail now is it because it does really impact on how well we can treat and remove this using our drinking water and wastewater treatment processes. I'm going to talk a little bit about the methods of detection now for this virus because again this has relevance for what I'm going to talk about later. So when we look at human patients, the typical method for uh, detection or the most used method for detection is a technique called RT-PCR, which is um, reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction. And what RT-PCR actually does is it detects specific signature pieces of RNA from this virus. Okay, so RT-PCR will detect little bits of, the, uh, of this genetic material that, uh, that we see on this side, and it will say whether or not the virus is present or not, or rather whether the RNA is present or not. So it's important to note that RT-PCR does not actually give an indication of whether the virus is infective or not. So for a virus to actually be infective, it has to have both the genetic material, the RNA, and also all of the, these other proteins present. So it has to have its lipid envelope intact as well as the RNA to be present for it to be actually infective. So there's a difference between the virus material being detected via RT-PCR and the virus actually being infective. And the infectivity is something that hasn't been as well studied yet as the detection of the RNA genetic material has been because it is um, that little bit more complex in terms of culturing of the virus. Um, so when we look at doing RNA uh, extraction or TPCR, what we can do is basically see are these little bits of RNA which are distinct to SARS-CoV-2, are they present? And what we do is we have um, particular probes which see little small parts of this RNA and they're distinct only to SARS-CoV-2, so they are not present in SARS, they're not present in MERS, they're not different in different types of influenza, and that lets us say for definitively that SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA is present or not. And this method of detection is also the method of detection that will often be used to detect the virus in environmental matrices, so different um, partitions of the environment. So that could be water, it could be soil, it could be in aerosols, it could be in any type of uh, samples that you take in the environment. Um, so that's the reason why I wanted to go into it in a little bit of detail um, at this point in time. Okay, so one of, the, one of the key questions that people will often have is, is my drinking water safe? Okay, so to answer that, um, first up, I have to say that there has been limited testing of the presence of SARS-CoV-2 specifically in global drinking water supplies, but there has been no evidence globally of its presence. But the key thing is that drinking water treatment technologies are designed to remove viruses. There are many, many viruses out there. And SARS-CoV-2 is not the most robust virus that is out there. There are viruses that are much, much harder to remove by disinfection because they are much more persistent and they are much uh, more resistant to disinfection. Mm -hmm. So because drinking water treatment is designed to remove these viruses that are quite difficult, so waterborne viruses such as enterovirus, norovirus, um, uh, viruses that are non-envelope, for example, many of these are the ones that tend to persist in water. SARS-CoV-2 is not uh, thought to be one of these uh, viruses. And 
corona type viruses have been extensively studied in these type of studies previously where they have reasonably similar uh, structure to SARS-CoV-2. So for example, if we look at studies that have gone on in SARS itself since 2003, um, we can tell that the drinking water treatment technologies that we have in place in developed countries is quite robust and is expected to remove SARS-CoV-2. In Qatar, our drinking water um, typically comes from desalination. The seawater is taken, it's pumped. Um, I have a picture down there of Russell Bufantis desalination plant. Um, and we use a combination of methods here in Qatar. Thermal methods, including multi-stage flash or, um, or MED, which heat the seawater up to very high temperatures to, to remove the salts from it and recover desalinated water. It is not expected that, uh, that SARS-CoV-2 would be able to survive a process like that. The other alternative is membrane-based processes such as reverse osmosis, which, um, which will not allow uh, viruses like SARS-CoV-2 through the membrane. Um, in other regions that don't rely on desalinated water, where they use surface water or groundwater sources as drinking water supplies, there are a variety of filtration um, techniques that are used in the drinking water treatment, such as sand filtration, granular actuated carbon, for example. Um, they are all also designed to remove viruses, but the key thing and the thing that is uh, common across drinking water treatment in development developed countries is the persistence of disinfection. So what people generally tend to be worried about is, okay, well, you can remove this virus at the drinking water treatment plant, but how do I know that you know, it's not in my tap when I turn on my tap in my house? So the key is the persistence of the disinfection. So disinfectants are routinely applied throughout drinking water treatment technologies. There are a number of different types of disinfection that can be applied. The most common is chlorination, and in Qatar, the most common um, chlorination agent that's used is chlorine dioxide. This is shown to be very persistent within the drinking water supply network. So what happens is this disinfection lasts through the piping as it goes through and underneath the city to the, to the direct supply to people's houses. Um, so that's why you know you you might hear people in certain countries or certain regions complain that when they turn their tap on they get a smell of chlorine from their water. It's that this disinfection is designed to persist throughout the drinking water system. However, um, it should be said that there needs to be ongoing research, of course, on the persistence of this virus. We are very, very sure that it can't persist in the system. However, it should be noted that biofilm, which is a, a film of bacteria that can build up on water, water pipes, and it's what this chlorination is designed to try to prevent, it is theoretically possible. So it's something where there is ongoing research. So the summary for drinking water, the general feeling is that it is very, very safe, but the research is still ongoing in that area. Um, the other thing is bottled water. So bottled water is generally treated in the same way that, that drinking water, municipal drinking water uh, is treated. Um, so bottled water should also be safe. The Ministry of Public Health does advise that you sanitize your groceries when you bring them home and the same should apply to bottles of drinking water that you, uh, that you buy. But in general, we would expect that uh, bottled water and tap water would generally be safe. Okay, so the next uh, aspect of, of water treatment is wastewater treatment. So what's important to note, first of all, is that the persistence and the infectivity of SARS-CoV-2 virus in fecal material is not yet clear. So they have been limited studies so far on the persistence. But what I will say is that there have been a lot of studies, clinical studies, on the presence of the virus in patients. And what seems to happen from the studies that have been published is that early on in the infection, the viral load can be seen mainly around the upper respiratory tract. However, as the progression of the virus continues, the number of days infected with the patient, that seems to move towards a higher concentration of viral material being found in the lower GI tract and in the feces of patients. And there have been studies that have shown that patients still have the presence of viral material, not clear if it's infectious or infected or not, but viral material has been present 
in more than 20 days in patients that have been infected. So the infectivity is not clear, but there is definitely presence. So this, of course, then translates into our wastewater treatment systems. So where you have uh, wastewater being collected in your sewers and going to a wastewater treatment plant. So the question is, what happens to that wastewater? And what about the water that comes out of the wastewater treatment plant at the end, which is called treated sewage effluent? So I want to give the example in Cather of how our wastewater is treated. So from houses, from hospitals, from industrial facilities, um, this all goes together into the sewer network and it goes to one of the main wastewater treatment plants um, that are dotted around Doha. What's critical here again is that these wastewater treatment uh, processes are designed already for viral removal and this is a regulated process for many viruses that again are much more robust than SARS-CoV-2. So while there has been a limited amount of study purely due to the, the time uh, that we have had to do this so far on a global scale, um, the confidence is there from previous viruses including uh, SARS that wastewater treatment technologies would remove uh, the virus. So if we have a look, there are a number of steps um, that are involved in the treatment of wastewater. Um, and I think we are, it's, it's safe to say that we're quite lucky in Cather. There has been massive investment into state-of-the-art wastewater treatment um, in this country. And it goes through primary treatment, preliminary screening, secondary biological treatment. But the key thing is the tertiary treatment that we have here in Qatar is really, really uh, second to none. Um, it includes chlorine contact, which again is the disinfection step that I was talking about earlier. This is already expected to eliminate SARS-CoV-2. We also have, and I have the example on the screen there of the, um, of the treatment train that is in Doha North wastewater treatment plant. It has ultrafiltration. Again, this is expected to be able to remove SARS-CoV-2. And critically, it has UV disinfection. So we know that SARS-CoV-2 is eliminated by the use of UV disinfection. So it's broken down. So we would expect that treated sewage effluent, that high grade uh, reclaimed water supply that goes out uh, for non-potable use, so things like agricultural or landscape irrigation, for example, um, we would be quite confident that, uh, this, is, uh, that this is free of SARS-CoV-2. Now, what, other, what people might wonder about as well is things like uh, lagoons or when we have had uh, strong rains recently and we've seen large puddles of water that persist for a number of days. Um, and the other thing that people might worry about is the sea. So is, is, is SARS-CoV-2 present in the sea? The short answer is we don't know. So the, the research has not managed to catch up yet because we're really in the early days of this virus and the majority of the research effort is, as it should be, focused on patients and on clinical um, aspects of SARS-CoV-2. So what we do know is we could expect, based on studies with other coronaviruses, including SARS, is that we could expect SARS-CoV-2 to persist in environmental matrices such as soil or standing water for a number of days. So this is definitely something that we need to have more research on. How long is it going to persist in these types of environmental matrices? We don't have any research yet that looks at uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the marine environment, in salt water. Um, we do know that you have, for example, aerosolization of salt in salt spray close to coasts where you have waves. We have no research on whether SARS-CoV-2 could be present in those type of environments. There have been very limited studies thus far on aerosolization itself of SARS-CoV-2. But we would have seen from the original SARS outbreak in 2003 that there could be potential for infection from aerosols, and that includes from human waste. So in the SARS, original SARS infection 2003, um, a faulty plumbing system in apartment buildings was implicated in the spread of the virus through people that had not been in contact with each other. 
I would say that in Qatar, we generally have uh, extremely well-built wastewater treatment in apartment buildings, for example. But it's definitely something to be aware of that when, for example, patients come home after they have been infected with COVID, that it would be very important to apply very strict hygiene practices. Um, for example, closing the toilet before you flush the toilet to, to, effect, to prevent aerosolization um, and that uh, really good plumbing is, is very important. We are lucky in Qatar and in developed countries that we do have these things in place. However, in uh, less well-developed countries, this is something that is definitely going to present as an issue. So where we do not have effective drinking water disinfection and where we do not have effective wastewater treatment, it is a possibility that this could have an impact on the persistence and on the spread of the virus. So there are many countries in which virtually untreated sewage is discharged to the environment, either to the marine environment or to the terrestrial environment. So this is definitely something where we need more research, we need more investment, and underdeveloped countries will need financial help in these kind of areas uh, from more developed countries. Okay, so uh, moving on then to the, to the last topic that I want to talk about, which is wastewater-based epidemiology. So I've been working in the area of wastewater-based epidemiology for a number of years, for uh, five or six years, um, as part of a global consortium that has looked at the use of wastewater-based epidemiology for looking at public health. So the principle of wastewater-based epidemiology is that you can track the exposure of a population to various different things. So it could be to pharmaceuticals or illicit drugs or alcohol or nicotine, or uh, in our case, I've been looking at the case of plasticizers for the last five years. And by looking at the wastewater of that pooled population, we can make estimates for the population exposure to those various different things. So if you look at where a population is the catchment for a wastewater treatment plant, and we can look at the amount of wastewater that is typically generated by a person in a day, and we can go and collect a sample of the raw wastewater at the wastewater treatment facility. And we, what we typically do is we look for biomarkers of a particular thing that somebody might be exposed to. So in the case of nicotine, for example, we can directly look for nicotine in the wastewater and we can get an estimate of the levels of smoking within that population from looking at the nicotine levels in wastewater. Um, we also can look at various different pharmaceuticals or drugs where we look at the metabolite of that drug as it's broken down by the human body. And we use mathematical models to look at the difference between what we see in the wastewater and an estimate of the human exposure to that original sample. So the drawback, of course, is that we can never say we can pinpoint an individual person or what the risk to an individual person might be, but we can pinpoint the level of risk to the population that serves that wastewater treatment plant. So we can look and we can look back and get an estimate of the daily mass loads to that population. So where this has, and this wastewater epidemiology is not new, but I would definitely say that it has started to come to the fore now in terms of this COVID-19 epidemic. So to give you a little history of what has been happening over the last couple of months in terms of this detection of this virus. So we know that the, the virus is, um, is, is found in fecal material and it was detected in a wastewater treatment plant in the Netherlands before there was a confirmed case of COVID-19 in the catchment area of that wastewater treatment plant. So this, of course, is extremely interesting because what it might point out is that this kind of technique could be used to monitor the presence or the changes in a population of the virus. So this has powered on, there's been a lot of detection now uh, over the last two months 
of viral material, it's detected in the exact same way that I mentioned previously. So we take a sample, it's processed, the RNA is extracted, and we use RT-PCR to quantify the presence or absence um, and the levels of the viral material. Again, it's not yet been shown whether it is infective or not. So that, that is a key thing, but we can look at the viral amount of viral material. So this is really, really interesting. We've seen it in wastewaters from Australia, from um, the United States, from a couple of other European countries. Um, it hasn't been looked at yet for Qatar um, or anywhere else in the Gulf, but it's really potentially interesting. However, the research really, really needs to continue in this area because there are a number of complications with this type of technique. So one of the first things is that the virus is not seen in the fecal matter of all patients. So what has been presented in the research studies, the clinical studies, is that it can be anything from 30% of patients up to close to 100% of patients. And it is not clear as yet why the viral material would be present or absent. Um, so that's not well understood yet. So if we look at, say, for example, a catchment area in Qatar, we as yet have no uh, data on what percentage of the population we might expect to display viral material in the fecal load of infected patients. So that's one thing. The second thing that we don't yet know enough about is how does the virus behave in the, uh, in the piping system? So how, when it gets from the hospital wastewater or from the home wastewater, when it ha when, as it's traveling through the sewer system to the wastewater treatment plant, which is where you take the sample, what actually happens to the virus or to the viral RNA in transit. So how long would it be expected to last? If we take a sample and we see X amount of viral RNA at that stage, how does that translate back to the actual amount of viral material that entered the serous system at the start? So this is something that really, there needs to be an awful lot more research done on that. Um, it's something that we don't have the data on yet. So for example, we can model at the moment, we can say that it has, for example, a half-life of 24 hours or 36 hours, and we can make estimates based on that, but the reality is that we don't have the raw data of how it behaves. The other thing that we don't yet know, but which will be critical for being able to use this as a technique, for example, to, um, to detect if there is a, a further outbreak expected next winter or something like that, um, is to know what the impact of changing temperature is going to be, because we would have very uh, strong temperature differences between seasons um, in, in countries all over the world. But in Qatar, we have particular extremes of temperature. And to know how this actually impacts on the behavior of the viral material as it travels through the sewer network is something that is really, really critical to look at. Um, however, it definitely looks very promising as a support to testing of actual humans. The key thing here is that testing of humans is really, really expensive. So the data looks like we could be able to detect as, as, as low infectivity as one case in over a million people by looking at the wastewater of a wastewater treatment plant. To actually do randomized testing of patients in that population of a million people um, could be in the order of over, uh, over four or 500 cathary real to test a person, whereas to do the wastewater testing could be could be you know four or five cathode rays. So there's a huge huge difference in the cost associated with using an environmental monitoring technique like this to look at the potential level of infection within a population. So while it may not be possible currently to give quantitative data or to be able to say you know for sure there is X number of people in the population have coronavirus, um, it, it can be used to support the ongoing testing, um, human testing and biomonitoring uh, that is undertaken by, by the various different countries. So it's definitely somewhere that the global research is focused on currently um, and somewhere that we hope to continue in, uh, in, in, in progressing um, against this virus. 
So uh, I'm going to leave it there and open the floor for questions. Um, hopefully we've had a lot of Q&A come in and I'll try to uh, answer as much as I can. So thank you and shukran. Sorry about that. I, I just realized I was on mute. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jenny, for that uh, in very interesting presentation. I mean, I think, uh, you know, beyond just relate what's related to COVID-19, it's interesting to know about how water is treated in Qatar. And, you know, it, at least for me, as somebody with a family, it's interesting to know, and I feel safe knowing that the drinking water we have here is safe. We are having quite a few uh, questions uh, come in. I'm just going to put up a few of them on onto the screen so that uh, our uh, listeners can understand what we are talking about. And but please continue to post your questions in the uh, Q&A tab. We want to answer as many questions as possible. Like Dr. Jenny said, this has to be an interactive experience, and we hope that you know uh, you've learned a lot from what Dr. Jenny has said. However, we are here to help you more and answer questions, and we look forward to receiving as many questions as you have. Okay, so the first question for you today, Dr. Jenny, is this: How can we, uh, how can the public be ensured that the TSE supplies, the TSE supplies, meaning the treated uh, sewage effluent supplies, to lawn and landscaping be free from COVID-19? Similarly, you know, so how do we know that uh, once the water is, we say, watered our plants, uh, is it seeping into the soil? What is going on there? Can you tell us a little bit more? Um, okay, so I think um, it's, we can be reasonably sure that the treated sewage effluent, certainly here in Qatar, is as free from COVID-19 as possible without actually having gone and tested it. Um, because, as I said, the, the treatment process is really designed to remove viruses that are much more robust than SARS-CoV-2. So because SARS-CoV-2 has this lipid layer that surrounds it, it actually makes it reasonably fragile um, and it's quite easy to break it down. That's why hand washing with soap and water has been so effective and it's really the best way of spreading. And of course, wastewater treatment processes are much more severe on the virus than, than simple washing with soap and water. So, um, and, and uh, from all of the research in terms of SARS and other viruses, um, because they're designed to remove viruses and to make TSE safe through the sewage effluent, um, we can be as sure as we can be to, to, that it is safe. Um, I mean, uh, when we go and spread on our lawn, we don't have any data as yet on the persistence of SARS-CoV-2 in soils, but we do have data on similar viruses. Um, it has been shown that SARS, for example, can persist in soils for up to 96 hours. Um, so I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that uh, there's no possibility that you could have SARS-CoV-2 on soil. Uh, maybe don't eat it, don't lick it, <laughs> and uh, you'll probably be be okay. You know, I mean, uh, uh, I think we have to be really careful with our kids in that case because we all know how much the toddlers and the little ones like to eat whatever they're not supposed to. But of course, we, I believe we are all uh, being extra careful uh, in, in these te testing times. Uh, yeah. One of our uh, listeners uh, wanted to know, how, apart from molecular methods like PCR, if you could maybe also tell us what PCR is for the non-scientists like myself, have you taken a look at the next generation sequencing methods to detect viruses in the in in the in water? Okay, so personally, I'm not a biologist, and this isn't an area in which I work. So I know that there is a lot of research to look at better and faster, more effective, more efficient uh, methods, and also methods that could potentially look at infectivity of the virus. And I know that there's a lot of research that's looking at developing other methods of detection, um, also ones that could be maybe cheaper and more effective for patients, but it's not an area of research for me personally. So while I'm aware of next generation sequencing methods, um, it's not something that I can comment on with any level of confidence. So I'm afraid I have to uh, potentially direct you to our colleagues in QBRI, Qatar Biomedical Research Institute, because they would be definitely best placed to answer that kind of question and point you to the research in that area. 
Thank you so much for that. Uh, for, for those who, who are listening to us, QBRI, uh, the Qatar Biomedical Research Institute, is also part of Ahmad bin Khalifa University, of which we are a part. Uh, and if you do have questions or related to this particular topic that you would like us to route to them, we will be showing you our email address at the end of the slides. And you can just send us a question and we'll make sure somebody from QBRI picks it up and responds to it for you. Uh, okay, so the next question, I mean, this is something I think everybody uh, uh, thinks about. Uh, soap and water seems to be the most uh, efficient and effective way to tackle, uh, you know, it from spreading, at least on ourselves. But how do we know for sure that tap water is clean enough? Uh, you know, uh, can you talk to us about what happens in Qatar, as well as, you know, like uh, from a global perspective? Yeah, so of course, the water that we're using to wash our hands is drinking water, it's potable water, so it has been treated in the exact same way as our drinking water. So we are quite confident that in developed countries that have good drinking water treatment technologies, that our drinking water will be clean for this purpose. As I said, it's designed to remove viruses that are that are waterborne viruses that are much more um, that are much more uh, persistent in water than SARS-CoV-2. Um, so for that reason, uh, we can be reasonably sure that our tap water is absolutely fine. The other thing is that we are washing our hands with soap, um, and that is something that will disrupt uh, viral and bacterial material. So the key thing is soap and water. So a rinse of your hands under the tap is not gonna be enough to remove any contamination from your hands. So the key is washing your hands with soap and water for an appropriate length of time. So the World Health Organization will advocate washing your hands for a period of 20 seconds with soap and water, and then you should have nothing to worry about. So that's about the the, the length of the a, the ABC song, if I'm not mistaken, right? I mean, uh, that's I think so, so yeah. Or happy birthday. Telling. Yeah. Oh, happy birthday. Yeah. So uh, meanwhile, uh, somebody has just uh, asked this question. So with with everybody essentially washing their hands more than what they would before, there is an increase in the quantity of soap that, that's going into uh, our seabed system. Do you, as a scientist who's, who's you know, looking at water research, feel that that could potentially cause uh, you know, some kind of a domino effect and harmful effects in the future, the, the increasing amount of soap and detergent or similar that's going in, into the soil? Okay, so um, there's there's kind of a number of issues related to that. So one of the things that has really been um, a hot topic for water professionals in recent weeks is the stress on the water um, utilities. And this is something that is global. And there are a number of stresses. One of the stresses is the change in water consumption patterns. So where we would previously, when everybody was not stuck at home, we would have seen peak consumption earlier in the day. That has now moved to a little later in the day, for example, as people are not getting up so early to travel and commute. Um, and another stress that we have seen, of course, is the increase in the use of soaps and detergents. So these are something that um, that do put a stress on the on the water treatment facilities, the wastewater treatment facilities, because that's where your water is going when you use the the hand washing and you know you're washing your floors and you're pouring the bucket of disinfectant down down the sink or down the drain they're going to the wastewater treatment facilities. So the way that wastewater treatment facilities work is they look to break down organic contaminants, which typically soaps and detergents are. And they are, of course, designed to break down detergents. You know, we always have uh, washing powder and different levels of disinfectant materials in wastewater. So they are designed to do this. And um, what it may do is change the residence time, for example, in the wastewater treatment facility. Um, however, these facilities are very well controlled and well automated, and they can look at the, uh, the level of removal of disinfectants and detergents from the wastewater and, and adjust the process as required. It may take more energy to do that, for example. So in an aerobic treatment process for wastewater, the biological treatment process, you may end up having higher energy usage as you, as you blow air into the, uh, into the activated sludge tank, for example. So this could be an impact. This could have a financial impact on the company. The other uh, financial impact that wastewater treatment operators are seeing around the world is potential financial impact from uh, bills not being paid, um, 
And also we have, of course, the need to protect the wastewater treat op operators themselves. This is also has financial implications. So there are a number of stresses on wastewater treatment and wastewater treatment operators. However, this is something that can definitely be dealt with um, in high-tech wastewater treatment plants, such as what we have in Qatar and most developed countries. The, uh, this will be a different story for underdeveloped countries that don't have as good uh, automation systems, for example, in place that look at the, that the levels of treatment in real time, for example. So this, this can be an issue, but probably not in Qatar. You know, at least as somebody who's living in Qatar, that, that you know, makes me feel a little more protected. Uh, one of the questions we have, just to see it is, you know, is there any way, or is there a risk of contamination to our water tank? Is is there any way that our water tank could be contaminated with the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the virus? And and is there any anything that we, as the general public, should do to make sure that the water we drink is uh, uh, is safe? You know, boiling or or something like that. What would you suggest? Okay, so I would say, um, un unlike a lot of countries, um, we have uh, water tanks, residential water tanks. So the water is treated, it's, it's piped around, and it sits in our water tank for a certain amount of time before we use it. So depending on, on the usage in the house, it'll sit in the water tank for a different length of time. So what I would definitely say is that it is good practice in general to have your water tank cleaned at, at maybe six monthly intervals. I think that's something that's very important, but it, it, it is unrelated to SARS-CoV-2. It is a general point that if your water tank is not clean, the water that comes into your house is not clean. Um, so that's a general point. It is unlikely that you could get uh, transmission of SARS-CoV-2 into your water tank. Your water tank is sealed from the elements unless unless you've got a problem with your water tank. Okay, so the disinfection will persist from the plant to your residential boundary, essentially, that's what it's designed to do. That should protect your residential, um, your residential uh, house itself. So you shouldn't get any presence of SARS-CoV-2 unless there is a problem with the, the plumbing or the water tank itself, it should be fine. You know, the more I, I, we hear from you, the safer I personally am feeling. Uh, the next question is, is this. I, I know you've touched upon it uh, in your talk, but uh, are there any definitive studies on the survival of COVID-19 in drinking water and wastewater? And while we're on that topic, somebody had also asked, how long can uh, this virus survive in water? Okay, so there haven't, there haven't been a, a studies, to my knowledge, yet on the survival of uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, it hasn't been detected in drinking water supplies globally. Um, we know that viruses in general do not tend to persist for a long time in water. Um, in wastewater, we know that viruses in general can tend to persist for a number of days. So anything from a number of hours up to a number of days in wastewater. Um, there are a number of things that will govern how long it survives. So one of those things is temperature. So viruses will survive for um, can survive for a reasonably long time, maybe up to 96 hours or beyond um, at, at low temperatures or even up to about 20 degrees. But once you go over that, there's a big impact on the, sur on the survival rate. So the higher the temperature, the, l the less time that um, it can survive. The other thing that we look at is the impact of pH in environmental matrices. So for example, viruses have been shown to be able to persist reasonably well when the pH is higher than about six. So in alkaline soils and an alkaline medium, we do see persistence. But again, it's, it's up to the kind of 96 hour mark um, and then the influence of temperature and pH will bring it down. So while there hasn't really been specific studies yet on SARS-CoV-2, on similar viruses, that's the kind of data that we have, and we can try and make inferences from that. But it's definitely uh, areas that is under research at the moment, but nothing really reported as yet. 
I mean, I think it comes down to what you said. It, it is a relatively new uh, virus. We've seen different versions of this, but this particular one is, is fairly new, and that's probably why you know, we have to wait longer uh, to see results. So we have a very interesting well, Dennis, that yes. the, the, um, something that hampers research in that area is that the reagents, the chemicals that are needed to do this type of work, are in competition with the reagents that are needed for clinical work. So right. it, it's very difficult to divert key chemicals that are needed to diagnose patients into research into water, in which we are already reasonably confident that, the, that from similar viruses that we should be reasonably well protected. So this is something that has definitely slowed down research efforts in that area. Um, and the other thing is the availability of appropriate um, laboratory settings in which to do this research. So um, many research institutes around the world are, are closed apart from the, the most essential of, of services and that in general relates to clinical research. So much more focused on health. So it's something that is gonna happen, but it will come through quite slowly. And we saw in the case of SARS from 2000, 2005 and beyond, and um, it was typically in in the order of a couple of years before these kind of results uh, were really able to come out in the research. Uh, that makes perfect sense. So thank you for that explanation. Uh, we have another question that just popped up on my screen here. So we understand that Qatar has a centralized water treatment. Am I right? It, it, it's right. So there are a number of water treatment plants. Yes. So there are a oh, number of okay. centralized water treatment facilities. Yes. So would we need or would you suggest, and this could possibly be also at a, at a global level and in different countries, would you uh, recommend or would you, do you think that we need a separate treatment facility solely for the hospitals and you know, for, the, for the special locations or maybe say the red zones where uh, the, the virus is spreading fast or is the treatment facilities that we have sufficient to make sure that the water that gets through is, is safe? Okay, so many hospitals and dental facilities, for example, will already have point of use disinfection systems. Um, so that is something that is already in place. And again, it's designed for viral and bacterial removal. Um, and that should be adequate for SARS-CoV-2 as well. So you'll have a specific water treatment. And the same goes for many, many industries. They have their own water treatment facilities on site. They don't simply rely on the municipal water treatment supply. So that is something that I think is already in place. In terms of, of hotspots of infection, um, in terms of wastewater treatment, um, that is something that remains to be seen. Um, because SARS-CoV-2 is reasonably easy to remove using conventional wastewater and disinfection techniques, my personal opinion would be that it is probably not necessary. Wastewater treatment plants honestly deal with far worse than SARS-CoV-2 and far worse loads, for example, from industry that are, that are very polluting loads. Things that we nearly need to be more worried about are things like, for example, where there are countries where you have dairy surpluses now, so huge amounts of milk that is not being sold. That needs to be treated as a polluting waste. It's so that, that is something that's difficult for a wastewater treatment plant to handle when you suddenly have huge volumes of, of material that's essentially a, a, a waste and um, where you, you have loads of milk going to the drain. That's something that's difficult for a wastewater treatment plant to handle. Levels of, of, of fecal load um, from hospitals, that, that's not something that's difficult to treat. That, that that's, you know, makes me feel safe and, and a bit unsafe at the same same time because you know you you mentioned that there's probably something worse out there so but hopefully it's not something we have to worry yeah, about at robust. this point in, in time. developed countries they're robust they're okay you know okay. they're designed to deal with these kind of things at least in Qatar we don't have the issue where you, you have huge amounts of of storm water runoff rainwater runoff they all go through the sewers as well at least Qatar is reasonably well controlled in terms of the volumes that it would expect to receive, for example. Um, things like the milk waste that I mentioned, they can be stored in tanks until it needs to be treated. So while it puts a load on the wastewater treatment plants, it's, it's, it's manageable. So developed countries, we are really well able to manage this. It's the underdeveloped infrastructure countries where you have leakages from wastewater treatment piping and sewers and that, and that kind of thing and direct discharge. 
they're the countries that really uh, that need help at this stage. Okay. So you know, while we're talking about water runoff, uh, somebody had uh, had asked, what about uh, like the groundwater? You know, uh, is that something that would be of concern, especially with uh, you know, like the storm that happened last week? Uh, it, do we have to be worried about the groundwater being contaminated? What are your opinions? Yeah, so we don't typically see large large levels of contamination of groundwater from the surface. So there's a certain amount of filtration and absorption processes that happen as water is percolating down through the soil and through the karst down to our groundwater aquifers. So typically for other viruses, while there isn't any uh, studies yet on SARS-CoV-2, for other viruses, we would typically not see transmission from things like rainwater or even agricultural runoff, which contains, um, you know, feces from from animals, we typically would not generally see contamination of groundwater with viruses. And um, we do see it for other things that may be present in in you know land spreading of sludges like um, pesticides and things like that. But for viruses, typically not. So we would expect that groundwater would be reasonably well protected. Um, however, I would point out that in Cather, groundwater is tri typically treated before it is used because our groundwater is um, ranges from moderately saline to quite saline. So it's typically treated before it can be used. Um, and often that takes the form of reverse osmosis, which would be uh, generally thought to remove viruses anyway. So I think we're generally quite safe from that perspective. Thank you so much for that reassurance. Uh, the next question is this. So what kind of monitoring strategies are needed to detect coronavirus in water and the environment? Uh, and uh, are we equipped in, in, in Qatar and the region to do so? Yeah, so there would be widespread monitoring of viruses in the environment as it is already and bacteria. So, for example, there would be um, regulatory driven monitoring of viruses in the marine environment, in surface waters, in soils, for example, um, and these would be able to be translated into monitoring of SARS-CoV-2. However, these are typically designed to monitor for viruses that are more persistent or bacteria that are more persistent. So there are particular viruses like enterovirus, norovirus, par parvovirus, and, and bacteria as well, like E. coli. Um, and we do monitor for them in most developed countries. But SARS-CoV-2 is not really thought, it's not really expected to be persistent. So I would be surprised if there is a move for large scale environmental monitoring of a virus like SARS-CoV-2. We don't see it for other similar viruses and the reason is that they're just not expected to be persistent in the environment. Um, I'm sure that it will come under consideration with legislators um, worldwide, but I think the focus will probably be on the things that we would expect to see lasting and posing a public health risk. Um, whereas for SARS-CoV-2, the, the real worry of transmission is human to human. There has been no cases identified thus far for fecal oral transmission, for example, and none from environmental transmission. Um, so uh, I think that this is probably something that uh, may not materialize in terms of environmental monitoring strategies. Let's absolutely hope it, it, it does not materialize. Um, you know, we just ha had one question come in, which is, is there a systematic process to monitor clinical wastewater? Or, you know, so we, we have touched upon this, but, but this, this specific question, so do hospitals have their own system to test the water that, that's going out? And, uh, or, or is it just tested once it reaches the uh, uh, treatment plant? Um, I am not sure about that. Uh, I don't know. I know that some hospitals would have their own wastewater treatment facility, which would be then designed to minimize the load on the municipal wastewater treatment facilities. Um, those are actually really to protect from the, the pharmaceutical load that would come from something like a hospital setting, not really for things like viruses, because the viruses are reasonably easy to remove. Um, so the short answer is, I'm not sure. Um, and it would vary from region to region and hospital to hospital. Thank you so much for your uh, honesty. It is quite refreshing 
to to hear that. Okay, so uh, the next question. I mean, I think this is relevant to to the situation as well as uh, generally, you know, beyond the COVID nineteen and maybe even before. So, is there something I can buy from the market that that I can test my water to know whether it is uh, it's safe? And that's one question. And and the related question I'd like to ask on on, on the same topic is, I know that. Kiri scientists in, in the water center a few years ago did a research that said the drinking the tap water is safe to drink. So, uh, but, you know, I mean, but there were some concerns of a tank and things like that. So would, would, the, uh, would I be able to buy a kit to test the water in my tank? And, uh, uh, you know, what kind of recommendations do you have? Yeah, so there are there are companies all over the world that will do this kind of testing for you in terms of um, checking whether you have a well and you want to test it or you want to test the drinking water in your house, for example. Um, typically, they don't come in the form of a kit that you test yourself. It's typically they'll send you out a, a sample bottle, for example, and instructions for how to take a sample and you send it back to them because there are a number of things that you would want to look at in your water to check if it's safe to drink or not. It's it's not only bacteria or viruses, you also want to look at various different levels of various different um, chemicals or compounds that could potentially be present um, in, a, in, in a sample of water. So typically it's not a kit that you would use at home and it gives you a result um, instantaneously. You'll typically take a sample and send it off to a company. And I know that there are a number of companies in Cather that, uh, that will do that service. Um, I can't think of the names of any of them uh, off the top of my head, and I probably shouldn't advertise them anyway, even if I did. But uh, it's definitely available. Uh, you can look it up. Now, I would say that there will not be anything currently on the market to test for SARS-CoV-2. The reason being, again, that currently all of the efforts are being put into testing of clinical samples. So I don't think that there will be any companies out there that will run tests for SARS-CoV-2 presence on a, on a supply, uh, on a domestic water supply. Uh, but possibly down the line, it could be added into the arsenal because these type of tests will look at bacterial contamination. They'll look at things like cryptosporidium, E. coli, um, viral material. So it could potentially be added in, but I think it will be far down the line. So that is interesting. I, I, you know, I, I didn't know I could call up a company to come and test my uh, water tank. I, and, and without asking you for company names, would you have an idea of uh, of the cost involved? Is it going to cost me like you know thousands of reals, or is it or is it going to be is it easy on the pocket? Again, no company names. I, I appreciate that. But, you know. <laughs> I th I think it's somewhere in the region of about five hundred real a sample. Okay, that that's you know when it comes to safety, that sounds fairly reasonable. All right. So I mean, it's, it's a sensible thing to do, to be honest. It's a sensible thing to do. And when I moved into a new villa, I got my water tested and I had my water tank cleaned. It's, it's, it's a sensible thing to do if you're going to drink the water. And not enough people in Cather drink their tap water. There's no question about that uh, because the, the water is treated to the highest quality. So if you look after your, your own residential system, then you should really consider drinking it instead of buying bottled water. Um, that that you mean like drinking it directly without additional filtration I'm in the house drinking it. and not yeah. uh, even well that is interesting I, I I you know I mean uh, maybe after today we'll see an increase in 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 the amount of tap water that's being used uh, for drinking purposes but of course like you said uh, and and we have to reiterate this uh, you know as, as a research institute that you need to ensure that your tanks are clean before you, you know, start uh, drinking it and uh, giving the water to your family. That's a critical right. thing. So, uh, uh, okay, so this is a, this is a question that we discussed earlier, uh, but we discussed the uh, the impact of soap. So, while what about the virus itself? So we're washing it away. Uh, am I right in thinking that we're breaking the molecule while we wash it with soap, or does this does it sort of just remove it from the uh, you know whatever it is that we buy? And does it go into the sewage system? Yeah, you will, you will disrupt a, p a portion of them, probably not 100% of them. So there will be some, if you have a virus on your hands, some of it will wash off to the sewer system, but the sewer system will, will handle it. It's no problem. And, and, uh, and, the way, and then it does get treated before it gets used into any other system, right? What about, okay. you know, while we are on, on, on this particular uh, point, what about uh, uh, marine life? It, you know, do you have any, any insights on 
how it will, because you know we all know that the drainage eventually ends up in, in, in the uh, waters around us. And does it affect marine life? Yeah, so again, here it's, it's well treated um, and we have regulatory levels of, of bacteria and viruses that can be uh, discharged. Um, however, there have been zero studies thus far on the impact of SARS-CoV-2 on marine life. And I haven't read any on SARS either. So um, the short answer is I'm not sure. There's been no studies on it yet. And I haven't seen any studies on SARS either. So it's potentially something to look at. I don't know. Uh, that is very interesting to know. I mean, uh, uh, I think because, again, it's, it's, it's a rel relatively new topic. And uh, as scientists, it must be in a very exciting period for all of you to see how this, how it's, it's changing every day. Now, the next question is not related specifically to COVID itself, but you know, as 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 a resident of Qatar, it would be interesting to know how is the water treated. Uh, we understand that a good percent, over seventy percent, of the water that we drink is from the sea water, is sea water, which is uh, you know essentially desalinated. So, can you tell us a little bit about the process that happens to make sure we get safe? Drinking water. It, it, it's actually over 99 point something percent of our drinking water is desalinated from the sea. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not just 70 percent. It's. It's almost 100 percent. Um, and I, I think I, I spoke about a couple of processes um, throughout the seminar in terms of um, how we desalinate. So the, the primary method in Qatar currently are thermal methods. So they include multi-stage flash and. Um, multi-effect distillation, those are thermal methods that essentially heat up the seawater and they vaporize it and then the, the vapor is condensed and the salt has been removed and any other impurities that are present are removed. Um, the, the heat that is required for that process is actually typically um, part of the electricity generation process from gas turbines and so those two processes have have historically been quite well coupled and that that's worked quite well together in a country like Qatar um, however there's definitely a move towards the use of uh, lower energy systems such as reverse osmosis reverse osmosis is a membrane based system which is used for desalination so you can um, a lot of people think about a membrane like um, like a barrier like a sieve reverse osmosis itself doesn't actually have pores in it it works on a diffusion type process where the water is able to diffuse through a reverse osmosis membrane under massive pressure like anything up to kind of 60 70 bar pressure so a huge amount of pressure but salts and other impurities including viruses including bacteria and um, they're not able to permeate or move through this dense membrane and um, so the water that permeates the treated water that comes out the far side should, is, is essentially free of everything actually we have to um, add minerals back into uh, desalinated water um, to make it suitable for for drinking and even suitable for for um, adding into the piping system. So typically you'll treat it um, either by, by thermal methods or by membrane methods. Um, it's then balanced to give a nice balance of minerals um, and to make it an appropriate pH uh, to make it suitable for drinking in terms of taste um, and, and, and odor, for example. Um, and it's also disinfected, as I mentioned. Um, it's, it's chlorinated as it travels uh, throughout the water distribution system. So that's kind of a, a whistle stop of uh, drinking water treatment in Qatar. Uh, I mean, uh, as somebody who's working in the field, you know, I, uh, for a moment there, I was wondering if, if we will spend the rest of this uh, webinar listening to it. But it is quite interesting. And, it, you know, it, it is interesting to know that this research actually happens in the country itself. And uh, uh, so we, we know that we can absolutely trust it. It's not the, the research is not just directly imported from outside. So we have another question that just came in. You know, if you're not going out and if you're not interacting with other people or, you know, or going to the supermarket and we're home, uh, is it still, would you still suggest washing your hands every two to three hours or, you know, uh, to stay safe? What, what is your sort of uh, take on it? I mean, you know, you also have to think about how much water we are actually ending up using during these times. So what's your thoughts? 
Um, yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's a good point. And water usage in, in Qatar is, is actually quite high on a per person basis. It's, it's higher than a lot of other countries. Um, but I think if you're staying at home, you're probably using the toilet every two to three hours anyway. So you'll probably end up washing your hands at various different parts of the day anyway. So I think don't, don't change what you're doing. Just have good basic hygiene practices. Uh, wash your hands before you eat uh, and after you use the toilet and when you're before cooking and, you know, don't change anything major like that. If you're not going out, you don't need to kind of be obsessively washing your hands. Uh, just general standard hygiene practices. All right. Thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, another question just popped up from uh, uh, you know from uh, Noah Masharif, who's who's a, who's a good friend of Kiri's, uh, in fact. Uh, is there treat any treated uh, wastewater re, uh, reuse in irrigation in Qatar that you know of? And uh, you know, if yes, to what level is 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 the treatment? While we are on that topic, I you know, I mean, there's a project that I personally love from your center, which is the Ablution Water Project. You know, so it would be interesting to hear a little bit about how uh, that as well, because it, it it involves some level of treatment. And you know, if you can tell us a little bit about that as well as how much uh, treated wastewater is used for irrigation, that would be great. Um, yeah, so it, it depends on the time of year and it depends on various different factors, but the levels of reuse of treated sewage effluent are quite high in Qatar, which is a really good thing because treated sewage effluent is a good, clean, useful source of water for non-drinking purposes. Um, so some of that will be diverted for irrigation. So for landscape irrigation, um, so irrigation of parks and of the uh, lovely trees and shrubs that we see beside the roadway. So often if you're taking a walk around uh, your local area, um, you might see um, a TSE sign on the, on the wall or sticking out of the sidewalk, for example. And you know then that there's TSE being pumped around and it's being used for irrigation of the landscaping. Um, it's a certain portion of it would also be used for say for example for fodder irrigation so for growing of food for animals for example and um, it's not typically used in direct agricultural irrigation in Qatar and um, another way that it is widely used in Qatar is in district cooling so the use of TSE for district cooling so this it, it's not going to contact the public in this way but it's used for um, it's used as, as a circulation water um, for district air conditioning systems so such as what you might have for example in West Bay or other highly populated or densely populated areas like that so it's widely reused there's a number of different types of uses of it um, and the key thing is that it's treated effectively and it's safe. So we have a number of different uh, treatment technologies which I outlined. They're the same that are used to remove the viruses um, and bacteria. The TSE is considered safe. Um, I, I have seen data from uh, treated sewage effluent from the various treatment plants around Doha um, and it really is treated to a very high quality. Um, so, and there are there are a lot of different treatment streams that can be intercepted. So you mentioned the ablution water. Ablution water is 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 very clean water that could be intercepted. There might be soap in it. There might be some level of bacteria. It's very easy to intercept that kind of water stream and utilize it for something else. So the project that you mentioned is looking at um, capturing ablution water from moss giving it a level of treatment that makes it lovely and clean and then potentially using it, say, for example, for cooling or for irrigation of landscaping around the mosque or um, we call this type of water grey water. It can be used, for example, for flushing toilets. Um, you know, you don't need drinking water, uh, quality water for flushing toilets, washing cars and um, watering your lawn you could use reclaimed water for those kind of purposes. And there's definitely a move in the interest of sustainability. And this is mandated by Qatar National Vision to increase the use of these kind of strategic water resources um, and not to waste them because it's much better for the environment. It's much more sustainable, much more energy efficient than the sole use of desalinated water for every purpose. Thank you so much for that uh, insight. And you know, it, it, it is heartening to know how Qatar stays committed to conserving the environment and uh, protecting its natural resources. In the interest of time, we will only be taking three more questions. You know, it is already 11:15, and you know, we have over 120 participants still with us. And thank you so much for your time and and, and your patience. The next question is: uh, 
this if if we are using large cans of bottled water which we see a lot usually you know kept outside houses how do we know that that's safe I, possibly you know we can believe the water inside itself is safe but how do we know that the bottle is safe and 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 in in a similar vein i think we have another question related to this which is how do we know the, that the fruits and vegetables that we bring into the house are safe yeah so um there the the ministry of public health has recommended that any groceries, including bottles of water or vegetables or anything like that, are disinfected when you bring them into your house. Um, when you buy something in the grocery, so the the, the research has shown that um, SARS-CoV-2 can remain on surfaces for anything up to a number of days. So the appropriate thing to do is anything that you can wipe down with disinfectant, that you do that. Um, that would include large, large cans of bottled water. Um, the other option is if something that you that you don't want to wipe down with disinfectant, like uh, fruits or vegetables, is that you could quarantine them for a number of days before you consume them. So, say for example, if if you buy a bag of carrots, that maybe you put them in the press for a few days before you use them, or you peel them and you wash them. And there are a number of ways that you can uh, that you can ensure this. And this is what is advised by the Ministry of Public Health um, in this regard. So if you have a look at their website, they have a lot of tips on how to um, how to deal with groceries. So that would fall under that category. Uh, thank you for that. I mean, it is uh, uh, a lot of us do wash everything, but quarantining the vegetables and fruits is, is an interesting idea as well. Uh, okay, we just, uh, I'm going to take a question from the uh, that just popped up on my screen. Uh, do you think that the virus is capable of altering its DNA or RNA uh, when it, it comes in contact with water? So uh, the short answer to that now is I don't know. I'm not a virologist, so I wouldn't be comfortable giving an answer to that. Um, I know that there uh, that there is potential for viruses to change and for different strains of viruses to come out. So we do see that with influenza, where there are different strains every year. So when you get a flu vaccine one year, it's not the same flu vaccine that you got the previous year. Um, the the vaccine is 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 a blend for maybe the top three or four um, influenza strains that they expect to see um, in a, in any given year. Um, but a, apart from that. That, that is not something that I can give an answer to, I'm afraid. So again, I'd have to ask that, uh, that QBRI or another more qualified uh, body could be, could be consulted in that regard. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, let's, I'm going to go straight into the next question. Uh, okay, we just answered that and we answered that too. So I think we have all pretty much answered all, all the questions that we have received. Uh, uh, and if we have missed any questions, sometimes it is easy to miss these questions. Uh, uh, please do email us and uh, uh, we will try and answer as many more questions as possible. Uh, Dr. Jenny, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for, for your time. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and thank you to all of the participants who have logged in today. Uh, and uh, it has been absolutely our pleasure to have you with us today. We look forward to having you all again for, for this webinar on uh, Thursday at 10 o'clock, where Dr. Veronica Bermudez, our Senior Research Director in, uh, for uh, Energy, will be talking about energy-related research in, 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 in the, you know, related to COVID and otherwise. And uh, that, that promises to be a very interesting session as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of uh, Keyes Executive Director, Dr. Mark Vermish, uh, uh, Water SRD, Dr. Jenny Lawler, and our entire team at HBKU and at Kiri, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again on Thursday, and uh, please continue to stay safe. Thank you, and bye-bye.